Gilman reporting for Katie Chats at the National Film Board in downtown Toronto with Jerry Flahive, a producer who's been here for over 30 years and has worked on approximately 70 various films. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about starting out here at the NFB in publicity, I believe, as a publicist, and how your career has developed and you've moved into different uh, roles over the years. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't think... Uh, I could have a career path like this one anywhere except the National Film Board, uh, partly because the Film Board does so many different things in film. It's uh, you know produces documentary and animation, but also is a distributor. Uh, you know, it's Canada's public distributor, and it always has been a very important part of its mandate. So, really, making the films and getting them out to audiences is always you know the two sides of what we do. And the Film Board's always had deep roots in communities across Canada, telling Canadian stories. So, a lot of the work over the years has just been involved meeting people, getting our films shown, and and the incredible change that I've seen has been in the technology. When I started, it was all 16 millimeter film. There was no video, no internet, obviously, uh, and so we had 10,000 16 millimeter film prints, and the only way people could see them was to come and borrow a projector if you didn't have a 16 millimeter projector in your living room. And so really what we had to do was get the films out there to really find new ways to get our films in front of audiences. There wasn't even, the Toronto Film Festival didn't even exist at that point. So it's always been a case of connecting with audiences. And now, of course, we've gone through waves of different technology. And now we reach audiences not just on the web, but in many, many different ways. So it's been, it's been an exciting journey. And you sort of started with the whole interactive journey with Water Life years ago. Can you tell me the importance of creating interactive content and maybe a little bit how you see the future of sure. film going, where it's going? Yeah, I, I think the board, again, has been one of the world leaders, one of the first to really engage in production for the web. And it's not very long ago, really. Uh, the first interactive project I worked on was something called Filmmaker in Residence with uh, director Katarina Sizik, where we were making documentaries at St. Michael's Hospital, but uh, kind of deciding to use the web as a platform to, as, as a creative platform to make things, to make documentaries. And that was, you know, 2006. At, you know, Cat started with us around 2004. No Facebook, no YouTube, no Twitter. You know, so that was at the beginning of this sort of explosion of social media. And even at that time, the idea of making a film to show on the web was still pretty new. But we were actually taking it a step further to say, uh, we're not making a film, a traditional film, and then showing it on the web. We do that, obviously, and the film board has thousands of films on the web. But using the web as a creative platform, the, the, the thing you're making is only going to be on the web. And it uses video, yes, but photography, text, audio, animation, all sorts of tools and interactivity to tell documentary stories in different ways. And so there was no business model for that. There was no um, established practice of how to do that. And so the film board again, as I think the only place in the world would, would say to its producers, run with it, try this out, that's part of our mandate to explore new ways of storytelling. And so we've done, I, I'm not sure how many of the board's done, maybe 50 or so of these interactive documentaries, but I think it does a number of things. It reaches audiences who would never see documentaries. Uh, and they might not see documentaries because they're not, they might think they're not interested in documentaries. Um, it reaches international audiences who may certainly have never heard of the National Film Board of Canada who might think they're not interested in Canadian stories. And the wonderful thing is they love Canadian stories. They just never had ready access to them. Now on the web with interactivity, it's there, it's instant. And I think the final thing that's great about um, interactive work is that it opens the doors to younger filmmakers, younger creators. There's no technological barrier. You have to learn some things, just as you do if you're learning to make a film. But you, you know the tools are, are there. There, there are you know many tools that are cheap or free to make an interactive. You can make an interactive documentary with a cell phone and a, and a camera. You know it can be photography and audio only. It doesn't have to be video. So that's just opening it up to a, a whole wave of new creators who might not even see themselves as filmmakers. They're just storytellers or artists and now their work can be can be made and seen really easily. So I think we've kind of led the way with some larger interactive projects like Water Life and High Rise and Bear 71 and the Insomnia Project. These really, you know, really established creators working on them. But I think it's in, in inspiring a younger generation to jump in. 
And can you speak a little bit to the educational value of having these interactive films where you can, as you go along, learn more about any specific thing that may interest you? Sure. It's, it's, it's actually a great question because I think uh, what I've found over the years when often the film board was making maybe one of the first films on a particular subject, and there was this um, almost a sense of burden. It's like, this is the first film on this. We've got to put everything in the film. It's all got to be in the film. And sometimes it creatively can really weigh a filmmaker down the sense that every film has to be comprehensive. What's great about interactivity um, is that you know all of that information, you know, additional information, additional resources can be off to the side. They can be supplemental, uh, supplementary. So the film itself can be the, what it should be is a piece of cinema, kind of creative storytelling that engages you. But if you want to understand more, and so with Water Life, for example, Water Life was inspired by a brilliant film by Kevin McMahon, a feature-length documentary shot in high definition all around the Great Lakes. Uh, huge number of visual assets. The interactive spun off from that. So, you know, Kevin just told a visually gorgeous story, but if you want to know more about pollution or about the environment or about wildlife, you go to the website, you dig down deeper. Mm -hmm. And we just did it recently with the High Rise Project called The Short History of the High Rise, where we've actually kind of integrated those things. You can simply uh, watch the films. It's about 17 minutes worth of, of filmmaking. You can just watch them passively, but at any point you can stop the films, dive down, turn the archival photographs over, over hear audio from experts, um, even play micro games if you want. And so that speaks to the sort of differing audience appetite. Some would just want to watch a documentary. Others would love to dive in more. And so we're really finding educators are now thinking about tablets, about interactivity. And so uh, we kind of have our cake and eat it too. We can tell a great straight ahead story but still have a huge amount of additional information for educators. And in terms of the high rise project there are so many different components and you know including live speakers and art installations. Uh, tell me a little bit about why you decided to do such a huge project that has all these different components and is also spanning various years sure. as well. Well I, I mean it, it's uh, it just speaks to the ambition of the film board to explore new approaches to storytelling and I think it's, you know, we've made 14,000 films, you know, the place is incredibly experienced as a huge back catalog of work and so we've made films about every possible subject and, and used different storytelling methods and so this is very consistent with, with that history, you know, the board, uh, the film board was involved in the early development of IMAX, you know, has developed all sorts of animation techniques. So this is a new platform or new, new platforms and so with high rise, we felt this is a global subject. You know, billions of people live in high rises. As the population becomes more urban, people are going to be living in high rise apartment buildings. Uh, but we also always wanted to keep things close to our Toronto roots, to our Canadian roots. And you know, when we did our research, we discovered Toronto is one of the most vertical cities in the world. We see it with the condo boom downtown, but it's actually been that way for 50, 60 years. There are more high rise apartment buildings in Toronto than most cities in the world, certainly uh, I think Toronto is number nine or ten in the world um, and it's not as big a city as Shanghai or London or Paris, more than any city in North America except New York. And so we thought there's something here, there's some stories here. High rises are part of that thing, they're part of our daily life, but we don't see them. You know, they're kind of just in the background and we think they're just these anonymous boxes, but of course they're full of human stories. So we started in Toronto, but we found it's a topic that really speaks to how people live. How do we live together in, in the 21st century? So we thought, you know, after the, the Filmmaker in Residence project we did at St. Michael's Hospital, we found if you're working for several years in a kind of umbrella theme like that, you not only do you find endless amount of stories, people come to you. You know, if you make one big film and it takes three or four years and then that film is finished, there's really no chance for dialogue or collaboration because it's finished. With High Rise, we deliberately set out to make multiple pieces, and each story kind of helps us define the platform. Maybe it is an interactive installation, maybe it's a live performance with Kat Sizek and some images from one of our web projects and live musicians. Uh, maybe it's an iPad uh, app. Whatever the, wherever the stories lead us, we, we sort of make decisions about the technology there. And so we've just found now, you know, we're nearing the end, it'll be finished in, in 2015, that um, it's just an incredibly rich pool of stories and when we started out we didn't want we called it platform agnostic we said you know it's sort of 2009 we don't know what technologies are going to be being used in 2014 mm -hmm. 2015 
why set them in stone? Let's wait and see. Let's, let's evolve along the way. So again, there's nowhere else on the planet except the National Film Board of Canada that would take that kind of risk, take that leap, but it's done in a very positive way. You know, uh, all the support that we got along the way was just like explore, experiment, try new things. And what we found is it's reached global audiences. We were approached by the New York Times. We did this project with the New York Times. That brings us a whole new audience, as I said, for Canadian work. And can you speak a little bit to also making so many projects about uh, issues within smaller communities, but also how community issues are global issues, especially with globalization and in Toronto being such a diverse city? Sure. I think that, you know, in some ways over the years, documentary has gotten a bad rap, you know, that documentaries are they're kind of, you know, they're sort of important, but they don't taste very good. You know, they're sort of like medicine you should take, but they're kind of boring. And I think that's a, you know, I think that's false. I mean, like any art form, there are good and bad examples, but I think uh, docu documentaries at their best are, are great cinema, great storytelling. They're not just containers of information. And so if you're going to a small community in Canada or a small community in a big city in Toronto, you know, in high rise, we've worked for years with residents in this apartment building up on Kipling. Uh, many people have come from all over the world. It's their first step in Canada is into an apartment building at Kipling and Steeles. They don't, you know, they haven't experienced any of, of downtown or the rest of Toronto. You know, is that, st are their stories, is that community interesting to people around the world? You might say, you know, maybe not. It's not relevant. But if you're, if you're doing journalism or current affairs, then probably not, you know, because people just want to know about their, you know, those sort of stories about their own community. But if you approach them as human stories that have depth, if you treat people with respect, if you see this as universal, there's something universal in everybody's story, people all over the world want to see these, these films. So you can kind of do both, really. You know, you can make work, documentary work, that is very relevant right now to the community you're serving or the broader community of Toronto or Canada, but have it reach an international audience and, and last, you know? And I think that that's all my training over the years at the film board. I always understood that when we're making films, you know, they may not be, they may not, uh, people may not be watching all of them 50 years from now, but there's a body of work that, you know, we made and our predecessors made at the film board that people are still watching 40, 50, 60 years later, 75 years later. And so that's a pretty high bar to reach for, and I think it really, it, it, it makes the work better. You know, if you're thinking this isn't just a disposable documentary that's not going to be relevant in, in a month, it's how, how would someone react to this if they saw it in 15 years? And so you approach the storytelling with that in mind. And after having made approximately 70 films here at the film board, I believe you may be leaving soon. Can you tell me what's next for you? Well, I, I've sort of always considered myself an accidental producer. I came <laughs> into it, I was a writer, I was a publicist, I was in marketing, I was in communications, and again, you know, I had the best film school in the world, you know, seeing the work that was being done here when I started in the 80s. And so, you know, I was given the opportunity to work on some films and, uh, and, and you know, try to find my own way as a producer. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I, I think, you know, I spent a big chunk of my life here. And I, I, what I've seen at the film board over that time, uh, from being, you know, the youngest kid in the building to maybe being the oldest, is that it's always been refreshed by new talent, you know, and, and we forget the giants of the NFB who started it in the, you know, the early years, in the 1940s. John Gerson was an established filmmaker, but Norman McLaren, Colin Lowe, Wolf Koenig, all of these people who really shaped the future of documentary and, and cinema, they, they were people in their 20s. You know, Evelyn Lambert, they were young people. And so I, I think, you know, the board always benefits from new talent coming in. And so, you know, it's, I'm just going to try some different things. I'm going to be, you know, writing and producing outside, but uh, the film board will always be part of me. It's where I grew up. And do you think that you'll continue working on projects with such social relevance um, as so many of your projects have, whether it's dealing with racism or religion or the environment and whatnot? I, I hope to. I, I, I really find uh, I'm, I'm, I've always been much more interested in documentary than drama. Um, I just think it's, it's an incredibly rich form. You know, real stories uh, beat most of what, what is in fiction. And there's nothing, I have to say, I mean, it's great. Our films premiere at TIFF, and they go at festivals around the world, Berlin and Sundance, and, you know, that's great, and it's been great 
to represent the film board internationally, you know, and, and the film board has this amazing reputation when you go, except they call us the Canadian Film Board, you know, it's like, you're from the Canadian Film Board. So that's great, but I have to say, nothing beats being at a community screening with a film that was made in that community where some of the people who are in the documentary are there, it's directly relevant, it has a powerful impact on them, and you see that response, you see there's, there's nothing more, it's, it's not a passive audience, or just, you know, that was a nice film. This is something that really means something to them and sometimes can transform a community. So I've found that unbelievably exciting and satisfying. So I hope to continue to do some of that. And where's the best place for us to find out more information on the NFB and all of the projects that you've produced past and present online? Well, nfb.ca is constantly being refreshed with, with new films and older films that are you know finally finding their way online. And um, highrise.nfb.ca is the home for uh, all things high rise, and we've, uh, we've added a number of projects over the years, and there's more to come. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations on a great career, and best of luck in your years to come. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. I'm Katie Ullman reporting for Katie Chads at the NFB in downtown Toronto.